apart from that, I am so pumped to talk to our very first, uh, well, our very, well, this amazing guest that we have here today. Mm. Um, and his name is Matt Bartholomew. Welcome, Matty. Hello, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure to be here, boys. Thank you. Yeah. Great, great to have Good you to on. Have you. And uh, I feel like this has been a very long-awaited uh, conversation. Mm-hmm. For sure. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Coincidentally, I had an exam last night as well. Did you? Yeah. Oh, what did you? What are you studying? It was a prescript course, Jordan Shallows. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. The Muscle Doc on Instagram. Really cool course. Beast. Oh, love cool him. Course. Yeah, love What's it, it called, yeah. the course? Uh, prescript. Oh, so, prescript. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. essentially there's a couple of levels. Um, coaches and practitioners tend to take part. Cool. So it's kind of in between. So there's a bunch of stuff in there that I'm sure I'll be able to review and learn more again nice yeah, um, right. but there was a ton of stuff that i picked up that filled a lot of gaps in knowledge so yeah awesome, super man. cool course do you feel cool. do you feel like it was um it sort of it was it uh, applicable from a rehab point of view or was it like very much strength and conditioning how, how um physiology there, there were like? certainly discussions that were had um within the lectures that um, Jordan was applying to rehab settings because he knew who he was talking to. Yeah. And then there was also these extra components um, where there were labs, like meetups, where further discussions were had. Um, and those were split into coach and practitioner. So right. those rabbit holes were able to be gone down, so so to speak. Yeah. yeah, cool. um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it applies, right? Because, like, a, a massive part of it was going from, you know, uh, trying to differentiate between, like, this rehab idea and, like, just exercising properly to essentially achieve those objectives of, you know, maybe shoulder function within a strength uh, training program. Yeah. Mm. Um, so it was just yeah it was very eye opening for me to sort of learn a few things down that lens mm. um, and also filled a lot of gaps for me from hypertrophy st- uh, standpoint because awesome. obviously being more of a strength coach yeah so yeah heaps of cool stuff anyway nice. yeah oh, nice why don't we uh, I guess let's let's kick it off with a little bit of an intro for you Maddie I think most people who um, I guess even follow us um, have probably seen you on our socials a little bit here and there. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know people within the powerlifting world at least in Australia and Sydney you know probably know your name um, but just for those who who don't know you or you know haven't heard your name before yep. um, if you could give us a little rundown about uh, I guess who you are and what you do and um, yeah absolutely um, so I guess I can start by telling a little bit of a story of since leaving school what I've been up to and where that's led me to um, so I, I started PTing straight out of school um, did a little bit of study in various areas, but uh, ended up falling into the coaching world, into the PT world, um, and from various other sporting backgrounds that we'll that we'll talk about, I fell into into powerlifting about four years ago, four and a bit years ago, hmm. um, and in that time as well, the last four or five years, I've been almost exclusively coaching powerlifters. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to work at um, Macquarie University Sports Centre uh, and then kind of narrowed down and started working at Athletes Authority. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like off the back of that name, you can see that I'm starting to work more with athletes, more with that sort of mentality. Uh, And now I work at Paragon Strength and Performance, Mm -hmm. like I said, pretty much exclusively with powerlifters. And, um, yeah, I've been competing on the national and international platform for a few years now too. So after about a year in the sport, I was able to break into that national platform sort of category. Uh, And I've been lucky enough to go to um, Singapore Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, and compete internationally as well and, and wear that green and gold. So um, as a power lifter, I've come a long way. Mm. I've had some really cool people in my corner, um, but I'm only just getting started. So yeah. That's yeah. where I'm at. Wow. Yeah. It's unreal. So good. It's a cool story. Yeah. And we're going di- to deep dive into yeah, it. I guess, yeah. So. It's kind of like the, the wide lens and we'll kind of yeah. zoom in on that. Yeah. Mate, for um, sure. I suppose it's, it's, always, it's always wonderful to see that, you know, I see so many athletes where often true athletes aren't just in one sport. They can transition really well because they either have very good skill acquisition, they can learn Mm. movements very quickly, Um, they can uh, adapt their strength and skill really well and quickly. There's there's a mental application there, you know? For yeah. sure. So, like, when you when you because you you didn't start off with powerlifting. You're obviously yeah. I started off in the weights room, training to get bigger and stronger to play rugby. Yep. You know, and essentially, um, you know, I was lucky enough to be at a school. I was at Kings, where strength and conditioning and sports like rugby were really highly valued as a yep. part of mm. that school experience. Mm. Um, and like we had some guidance. With what I know now, um, you know, that maybe could have been a little bit better. But hold, like, hold it, hold it. Know, that, yeah. that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's where I'm at. But like, yeah. that's, that's something I'm happy to say. You are probably pretty lucky yeah. as well with Kings. Like, I know their gym setup is unreal. So Gym's you're exposed, mm. unreal. You're exposed yeah. to a really good gym early unreal, on as well. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. I just think that since I was in school, 
the strength and conditioning world has progressed so much. So it isn't even a dig. It's more mm. of just like, oh my goodness, I wish I knew what I know now. Mm, yeah. mm. And I'd actually, I'd actually really love to get back there mm. as a coach and be that guy Rewind, yeah, in yeah. the future and, and, and create a better platform than what I had happened to have mm. because of where knowledge and literature and whatever was at that oh, point, man. right? Yeah. yeah, fully. It has, it has, it has evolved immensely mm. I feel like the strength and conditioning like the mainstream strength and conditioning world and like how gen, how gen pop people train and how coaches train people has advanced a massive amount in, in, in yeah. my time in the industry yep. 100%. when I came into the industry as a PT it was like so three four bang off you go cool oh. like just do some curls and squat and like try to do something right yep. mm. and that was kind of like cool that's a hundred dollars an hour it's like what yeah. Whereas now it's like you've really got to know some stuff, yeah. and people know what knowing stuff looks like. Yeah, you know. So there's so much out there. People think, are people yeah. are accessing this information, and more is asked of the coach or the PT, which is in, a good thing. Absolutely, yeah. there's more accountability. Oh, I, I, th- yeah. I think the PT, the PTs of the world have probably one of the most important jobs. Yeah, and and if you don't, if you're not a generalist as a PT, if you don't understand yeah. a, a very good but limited level of understanding across broad domains mm. totally. you are literally leaving your your clients mm. open to risk 100 percent. i got my i mean when i did, be a good I did my cert three four in 2010 or something it was literally four weeks yeah, of right. back to back i paid five grand or something and then it was all right on your way i knew nothing <laughs> that's <laughs> well, it well thankfully i knew a little bit from my background and training but like it it was very very limited and yeah. i mm. could can only imagine how undercooked some people come out of that course you know mm. like yeah i had yeah. some stat like in australia ten thousand pts ended up the industry every oh, year yeah. and ten thousand and ten thousand wow. and ten thousand exit the industry every <laughs> year. Oh, right. shit. so the turn balances out the regurgi- <laughs> wow. but the regurgitation of rubbish aka that's, that's more than physios in australia physio is like 1200 a year or something yeah. 1300 a year oh, dude. no in, that's how many there Wales. are that's how many there are in australia yeah that's nuts yeah, dude. crazy so like i don't know how accurate that something stat like that. is mm. but it's a huge amount and what that really tells us is it's incredibly easy access. Mm. So you've got to go into a four week course or something yeah. like that to get there. As long as you've got the yeah. money, you're all good. And oh. you now have access to training humans, mm. you know, which is like, wow, okay, we've got a lot of power here. Yeah. And then people yeah. are realizing, actually, I don't really care as much as I thought about this thing that was really easy to access. And then they're out. Yeah. yeah. It's quite hard. Yeah. It's quite yes. cutthroat. Yes. You know? Definitely. So, Yes. Well, I mean, um, I suppose that, and we digress because really what, what, what we want to go back to, if, if we can, yeah. is talk about like some of the best athletes aren't just good at a sport they're able to transition from like you said the weight room for rugby how much do you feel like rugby because i presume you 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 know you don't sort of get to play rugby at kings if you're mediocre you've got to be pretty good as a schoolboy. Yeah. um and how do you go like do you feel like that background actually helps push you into into sort of being better than most at, at powerlifting or do you feel like that's not a given? Yeah, look, I think like, you know, when, when you when you discuss um, rugby at Kings, like there are many grades, like anyone can play. Of course, sure. But I played in the second grade and then I played um, first grade Colts at Eastwood and then I played New South Wales level sevens. So yeah. I was pretty good. Yeah. Um, I wasn't ever really looking higher than that. I didn't really have that same passion that I've now developed for powerlifting. Mm. Right. But I had a passion for the... Um, the camaraderie of rugby, the camaraderie of sports like rowing that I also did at, at Kings. Um, and the, the, the funny thing was when I transitioned onto powerlifting, it was a realization that I actually, I love the lifting weights component mm. of my rugby training so much more than like rugby in itself. Yep. But to go back to the idea of like, did like essentially did rugby maybe equip me for powerlifting success? Um, or did sport in school, the way we did things in school equip me? I would say absolutely yes. And that's paired with like the way I was raised. So, you know, what my parents have done for me and the things they've instilled in me. And then those things have been complemented by a pretty cutthroat, methodical process of training and earning return, right? And being graded and, and, and earning a certain grade in the divisions of rugby. Um, and some of the rigorous sessions we were put through, um, that kind of long-term development, I think for me as a mentality, uh, I turned into someone and I think early on naturally from again, how I was raised, I've always craved that, um, seeking that, I guess that zone above normal, Mm. that zone above normal of effort, that zone above normal of what's there. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was definitely fostered in the environment of rugby, in that environment of rowing back in school. Right. 
and that certainly pays through to powerlifting. But uh, funnily enough, if I just quickly touch on that, I've I've spoken a lot about how this can actually be a weakness in powerlifting, right? Okay. In the sense that I know how to, and I've learned how to push myself very, 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 very hard in sports where that's a really positive thing. Mm. So if you look at rowing, for example, um, pushing through pain and pushing mental barriers when you're in the boat and your skin's ripping and mm. the body's full of lactic acid, that's a really positive thing. Yeah. But I've literally walked myself into compartment syndrome in training yeah. as a powerlifter because I, I didn't know when to, to scale back as a powerlifter. Powerlifting is a much more calculated training methodology. <laughs> it sure yeah. is. And so I've taken this yeah. like supposed strength, which is certainly a strength, mm. but I've had to learn how to taper it to make it a real strength. Mm. Yeah. Does that make sense? It yes. certainly does. Yeah, it does, yeah. It certainly does. Yeah, like uh, 100%. Like it's, in, it's like a maturity. And especially in team sport where you've got other people around you who are, who are working at that same capacity and pushing you to work at that level. Um, mm. Yeah, you're right. Like it just doesn't carry over to powerlifting as much as it does other team sports. Mm. Was there an element of going from, you know, majority team sports to a sport which is, um, you know, relatively solo and singular? Was that a big transition for you to make or did you find that pretty easy? I found that pretty easy. Mm. Um, I always really enjoyed team training and, and, and playing, you know, on the weekends. Mm. Um, but really a lot of my passion for training is, is really intrinsic. Mm. Mm. So like little things like when I was younger, um, when I say younger, like in school, weird things like, I remember this habit that I had that if it was raining, I would go outside and do some kind of exercise like skipping or something like that because I really enjoyed uh, training when I knew others weren't. Mm, it's a okay. weird mentality. Mm -hmm. right? But essentially a lot of it is intrinsically driven. And so that which lives in me and has always has been able to be highlighted and to grow in powerlifting. So if anything, powerlifting has been way more suitable for the, for the mindset that has always existed in me. Yeah. You know, like love team sports, love being around the boys, you know, playing, playing on the weekends. Mm. Um, but really if it came to doing extras, if it came to doing more work, I was there. Yes. You know? And I think for you, like knowing you as well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but where your efforts are also determined by other people, as well, um, as in like there's the collective team. Yes. I don't know if that was anything that played into it as well, moving into a solo sport. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Um, yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head. Mm. When it comes to shaping up on the weekends against another team, mm. uh, if seven of the 15 on the field mm. are playing poorly, yeah. Yeah, that brings the average down a huge amount. Yeah. Yes. And you could be giving all the effort you like and be so committed to your training and your team loses championship. Mm. And it's like very hard to swallow in some ways. Um, and I've really, enjoyed the accountability and the responsibility of being like hold on a second all the inputs here really are mine yeah yeah when it comes to getting sleep nailing my nutrition yes working with people who can help me to do those things and guide me in those facets but hey mm. when it comes down to it the execution it's, it's, it's on you yeah. it's really me yeah, yeah and then when you come to that end result you've got that pure accountability mm. yes you know yeah mm. definitely doing things that others won't so that you can achieve things that others can't essentially <laughs> essentially that's the, yeah. that's that's the mindset you know and i think like that's surely a mindset that lives within most elite athletes like i like i wish so badly that powerlifting was in the olympics mm. because mm. so many so many times that it comes to doing something something difficult that so easy to say i really can't be bothered doing this you know in maybe a more aggressive way than that um yeah in those moments, <laughs> I honestly say to myself often, what would an Olympian do in these moments? Yeah. Olympians train and do these things every day for four years minimum. Yeah. yeah. Often three cycles of that mm -hmm. to get their success. Yeah. Yes. And that's like a mindset that I admire so much. Yeah. You know, and I try to as much as I can, even though like my job is not my sport, I actually coach mm. in powerlifting, but like that's not me doing the little things that make sense. Yeah. Um, and powerlifting isn't funded and same with other sports and whatnot. So I can't do that, but I try as much as I can to, to bring that mentality because I admire it so much. That's interesting. That is interesting. And it sounds like as, as you're sort of like, we've known you for several years now and, uh, and something that sort of just dawned on me just listening to you right now, it's, it's really not, I mean, yeah, powerlifting, I'm, you know, I can tell you've fallen in love with it and there is that intrinsic desire. But I suppose my question here is, is that intrinsic desire powerlifting? Or is that intrinsic desire to play this game of being able to do the pl make the right move at the right time? And does it necessarily need to be powerlifting? Mm. You can just do that across the board with anything, really. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, and essentially, 
power thing is just the vehicle. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, and it's the vehicle that I'm that I've fallen in love with, and I really and I really enjoy, and that might be it for the for the end game. Yeah. Or it could be some other vehicle in five years. Yeah. And that's yeah. I'm totally open to that. Most definitely, I see people like there is a big scale of of motivation. So motivation is you know scales from apathy to then having several components of external motivation, and then you have the intrinsic motivation. Yeah. That intrinsic motivation is what drives behavior just organically. Mm. And I think what I don't see from you. Uh, is any any external reason for you to train i.e. Mm. I can't let my coach down mm. I can't do I can't I have to do this because I you know someone that people that need uh, a PT session yeah. to keep them accountable yes. that they are externally motivated but you mate you could be there all day if you fucking if, if you wanted to mm. that was my first swear word today oh yeah yeah <laughs> I fell back a couple of times yeah. no 18. you're right you're right okay <laughs> I remember, yeah. I remember you mentioning as well, Maddie, like during um, COVID, how you enjoyed training at home. And like, obviously, we see quite a lot of CrossFitters and that's a big group of people who do rely quite a bit on external motivation. So yes. I, think, I think you're right, Nico. Letting, like, letting their com- like the camaraderie gets them there. Yeah, it's probably a common theme with powerlifters where, yeah, like a bit more intrinsic motivation because you're the one that's got to get to the gym, pick up the weight and, you know, you've got to track it and, you know, tick all mm. the boxes. Yeah, no one's so. lifting that weight for you. You yeah. can't cheat a rep. Exactly. Like, mm. if you don't lift it, it's going to crush you. Yeah, <laughs> like, you've right. got to do the work. It's not like you're in a CrossFit box with 20, 20 people around you. Yeah, you just cut your, cut your, you just skip a few reps. Yeah, exactly. Just count, one rep equals that three. Like my, that sounds like my CrossFit session. <laughs> yeah. Look over your shoulder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no one's around. I just did three war balls. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> 30. 30. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Whew. Now I'm getting fitter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> every minute on the minute, every three minutes on the minute. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Pretty much. Yeah. So I suppose, um, I suppose, you know, we've, we've touched, we want to touch on a few things. The first one, being your your sporting background uh we've talked a little bit already about your um transition points from rugby to powerlifting and how sort of rugby helped you but it's sounding like the transition point doesn't matter so much it's more the fact that your intrinsic motivation is there yeah um i suppose now i want to just circle back to um to you know like i mean we're physios and chiros i mean we look after we've looked after you for several years now Mm. um injuries is a big part of people's lives um, and a lot of people are hampered by them, by injuries and pain. Um, and we've actually had people come up to us and tell us, it's so awesome to hear how much this podcast has actually helped them with their understanding of their own pain mm-hmm. and the fact that they're not the only one that have has pain. But I'm super interested, and if you're open to share, uh, maybe just some of the big injuries that you've had and how that's impacted you, your life, and your training. Absolutely. Um, if we rewind to rugby days... Um, the biggest injury that I had in my time playing rugby was a uh, MCL tear of the knee uh, with some bone bruising, meniscus damage, whatnot, uh, which was pretty much just like blunt force, like, see you later, um, where some big, big old, big old prop, proppy just uh, <laughs> fell on me knee <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> and um, it takes. <laughs> that was actually, um, that was super heartbreaking mm. because in that vehicle, right? I had progressed from a point where um, back in school we'd actually done a MCL tear of the elbow, mm-hmm. not in rugby, mm. different story. Um, that process really restricted me from making that first grade side. Mm. And I was in the second grade side after recovery, right? And I worked through that process, went over to Eastwood, started in sort of second, third grade Colts, worked up to first grade. Mm-hmm. That was about second or third game and I did my knee. Oh, mm. yeah. Right? So I just climb, climb, climb the mountain. Effectively, I'm getting like going up about this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Man, so yeah. emotional. <laughs> um, I just climbed the mountain and achieved what I wanted to achieve, or started to get to that level, you know. Mm. And then this this thing really out of my control happened. Mm. Um, I think I lost 13 centimeters of circumference on my quad. Mm. Shit. In a few months. Your quad was looking like mine. <laughs> That's quite <laughs> at its best. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> after after um, a squat sesh. <laughs> And yeah, honestly, like my, my dad and I had a lot of deep chats during this process because that was really mentally tough oh, yeah. Yeah. for me. Like I was like pretty upset, um, very upset. Um, I remember, uh, I remember some, some chats. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was, that was a process. But, you know, just like I do with most things, I was able to find perspective what, on that. What were you trying to work through? What was some, do you mind if you share some of those chats or would you prefer to keep that? Yeah. So, I mean... Uh, Essentially, well, yeah. es- essentially, a lot of that is was was based around um, when you have this mentality that I'm describing. It's an all fucking in, yeah. like it's yeah. all in. It's chips on the table, uh, risk, mm. right? And the risk is there. 
And I talk about this a lot with my lifters because I got some lifters who'll miss a lift and they cry mm. and I love to see it. Yeah. And I have other lifters who'll miss, laugh it off, brush it off, see you later. I'm like, you're not really chips on the table about this. Yeah. Right? So there's a difference. And so I put all my chips on the table with the rugby scenario. All in on a bet, lost a bet, life, life's earnings, so to speak, gone. Mm. <clears throat> right? So that was the mentality. And so for, for myself, the conversations with my dad were around uh, working through that process in stages. Like it was so useful to have chats around finding perspective around the small wins of the rehab progress of, of whatnot, right? So that's kind of where we were at with it. And that's the mentality. It's like, some people won't get that. It's like, some people will look at an athlete who fails and cries and go, what a cry baby, what a wuss. No, you don't understand. Like for the most part, for the most part, the reason that emotion surfaces is because there is so much invested in, in that person, mm. in their process mm. that some people will never understand. Like I can explain it to you guys right now. You might not actually understand truly how I feel right now. Mm. No. And that's, that's the process that we went through. Mm. But again, like that experience is a badge and it's a piece of armor for now. Mm. So I've had my own experiences within the powerlifting process where I have the fortitude to handle things that come my way mm. because of those experiences. And that's the kind of process we went through. It's like finding that glass half full process because some people will experience something like that and it's too much and then you never really see them again. They never really put the, the yep. chips on the table again. Mm. Yeah. And this is a tough one as well. I talk to a lot of my athletes about as their coach is you fail mm. sometimes in whatever endeavor you're doing, but let's talk powerlifting. You fail from time to time and it's very important that we don't let those fails take away from our all-in mentality mm. if that's what we want yes, if that's yes. what we truly want you yeah know? so yeah i guess that's a little bit of an insight i'm not sure if that's super clear but mm. well i think there's there's definitely like a grieving process that you've had to go through of yeah. of, of lose of the perceivable loss yep. uh mm. of the life earning as, as you've put it yep. and you know <clears throat> when you're when you've just had an injury that you're just not sure how exactly coming back to like, am I going to be the same again? Like, mm. like that, those questions have to go through your mind yeah. throughout that process, especially when you get up out of the chair and your mm. knee wants to buckle under you yep. because you have no MCL. Mm. Uh, it's kind of like, well, oh shit, what happens when I need to change direction? Mm. There's also like, how old were you when this happened, Matty? Uh, would have been 20. 20, yeah. So like, and you know, first major, major injury, it's having the emotional maturity and the experience with injury and rehab and yeah. all these things which which um, guides your your you know future experience.